Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming here. I need, before introducing uh, the two speakers today, just to remind you of the purpose of this uh, press briefing. The purpose of it is just to try to answer some of your concerns. Of course, um, Gilbert Betty is senior uh, legal advisor for uh, the pretrial chambers, and Mohamed El Zaidi is the legal officer of pretrial chamber too. And as legal officers, they will not enter into the merits of what you are seeing uh, during the conference, uh, the, the um, confirmation of charges uh, hearings. Um, so don't try to ask questions on the merits, on what do you think of this witness, or if this evidence is strong, etc. That's not the role. This is for the judges to evaluate uh, the evidence. They are here just to help you understanding what was the process up to now and what will be the process and the next steps uh, after that. So uh, I don't know if Gilbert, you want to make a, a little briefing on what has been done, or just okay, we we'll just open the floor. I there. think the best is that. Uh, okay, so questions. we'll open it for we'll open it for you now. So, any question from your side, Alex? Uh, yes, I think it's arising from what Kenyans are asking. From the proceedings, the impression given is that the prosecutor did not do much. I know it may put down the merits or the merits of the case, but the concern is if there was so much he did and is not given, how useful is it? Where where would it go? That the prosecutor did not do any investigations, he just relied on uh, human rights reports and hearsay, so to speak. Uh, the question of the prosecutor, whether he investigated properly or not, uh, that's a matter for the prosecutor and for a final determination for the judges. This means that after the hearing has ended, what the judges will do, they will go through the evidence. If they found that the evidence is not enough, they might, as one option, go back to the prosecutor and say, listen, you need to investigate further because we see that there is a problem here. Alternatively, the judges might decide to say, okay, what we have is not enough, and therefore we're going to decline to confirm charges. So at the end of the day, it would be a matter of evaluation of the evidence, and this is something which is in the hands of the judges. So nothing is going to be arbitrarily decided. So rest assured that there is a monitoring process that is going to take place, and a final determination is going to be and uh, uh, done by three judges. Would this answer your question? Hi, Jeff Greenango from K24 Television. Two things. One, is it going to, we've been hearing, it's going to take up to 60 days for the ruling, right? Yes or no, is that true or not? And if these charges are confirmed, will all the suspects have to be present in the courtroom and if they are confirmed, does that mean that they will have to remain, or will they be able to go back and forth if the charges are confirmed? You understand? In other words, will they be arrested? First, those people are free. So they are free to go back to Kenya? Now. Now. Now they are free to go back to Kenya. Uh, they are not arrested. They have voluntarily appeared before the ICC they are free to go back to Kenya. They will have to come back when the court decides that they have to come back. That's the conditions in the summons to appeal. Up to 60 days, yes, indeed, that's regulation 53 of the regulations of the court. It's up to 60 days. Those 60 days will start to run at the end of the written uh, observations by the parties which I think was established yesterday, on 24 October. Lastly, this is a regulation of the court, 53. It can be changed if good cause is shown. So this delay of 60 days can be changed by the judges themselves, if good cause is shown. For the moment, no decision has been taken in this respect which means that you will start to count for the moment the 60 days on 24 October. What about if they rule that this, this case goes to trial? 
Est-ce qu'ils sont arrêtés si les charges sont confirmées Non. Up until there is no decision to arrest those person, and for the moment, for the moment there is no decision to arrest anyone, those people will remain free. What cannot be done is a trial in absentia. So if there is a trial, they will have to come for the trial. This does not mean that they will be arrested during the time of the trial. That will be in the hands of the trial judges, who will be different from the pre-trial judges. There will be three other judges, and they will decide. Uh, John Allenham from uh, NTV. I've got two questions um, arising from uh, part of the statement of the legal representative of the victims in, uh, yesterday. Um, she read out an email um, where one of her field officers uh, said that uh, there was incitement and that sort of thing, and that the, more importantly, the names of the witnesses that were protected by the prosecution are known. These are names that I'm sure a number of journalists have also heard. What sort of restrictions or legal instruments can you put into force to ensure that from the defense or from the prosecution this doesn't leak out? And if it has, as it's being alleged already, what can you do um, with regard to those people, their families, their associates? And the second question um, is with regard to the people who appeared in open court. Uh, for instance, the defense witnesses that were here during the confirmation hearings. Um, given how sensitive the, the case is to Kenyans, their testimony in one way or another could be perceived as insightful or as incendiary to one community or another. How do you ensure that uh, these people do not become victims of their own testimony? Well, generally speaking, protection of victims or witnesses is taken care of by a special unit, which is the uh, VWU, or Victims and Witnesses Unit. And there are certain measures that this uh, particular organ of the court uh, takes throughout the proceedings. The chambers have some monitoring process by uh, way of or uh, by way of decisions receive certain um, reports from those units. Of course, these reports uh, are mainly confidential to ensure that the information inside is not leaked and it's just for the chamber to be able to be informed about uh, the protection of those witnesses. And the chamber reacts accordingly in relation to the information that is provided to it, meaning that based on the information received in these reports, the chamber takes certain measures, how to protect those witnesses, whether you need to, um, for example, uh, to redact certain parts of statements of those witnesses in order to avoid identification of those witnesses, some measures of that kind. Of course, that's what I'm giving you as an example for that. Maybe my colleague Gilbert Bitti can, if he wants to add something more. There could be witnesses or victims. It's the victims and witnesses unit, not only the witnesses unit. So we could relocate people either within Kenya, in another area of Kenya, or outside Kenya. That's the uh, most dramatic measures, I would say, that we can do. There's been, um, from the closed sessions, there's, there's been some names, for instance, of members of parliament who are adversely mentioned, that were mentioned within closed sessions, that are now in the public domain as a result of uh, people who are within the, the court itself talking about them outside of that. What measures can you take to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Or are you taking these, these sorts of leaks that have already occurred in these confirmation hearings seriously now? Um, there could be disciplinary proceedings against any person who is found to be responsible for leaks. Okay. Just, just to clarify the, the issue, um, when the judges decide that some parts are confidential, that this uh, information is confidential or should be redacted, or that uh, this testimony has to be conducted in a closed session. That means that the lawyers of the defense, the legal representative of victims, and the lawyers of the prosecution have to respect this order. What Gilbert uh, Bitti has just said is that if there is a, a violation of uh, uh, this order of the judges, that might be disciplinary uh, and even more uh, measures that can be conducted against, adopted against these uh, lawyers. 
for the issue of the security of uh, victims and witnesses in Kenya. I know that there is a lot of um, concerns or reports of, on concerns of victims or witnesses there. Uh, we need to indicate that, uh, as Mohammed has just explained, there is a, a specialized uh, with, um, unit, the Victims and Witnesses Unit, that takes care of the protection of the victims and of the witnesses of any threat that is in relation uh, with their uh, uh, involvement with the court, so with this uh, case. But you need also to remember the assessment of the threat and the decision on which measure has to be adopted uh, this is in the hands of the court. So some people might have concern, but it was it would be for the court to assess if there is a real threat and to say what is the appropriate measure to answer this threat. We don't have all the time to relocate the persons. Sometimes other measures, more simple measures, discretion, reduction of names, uh, imposing confidentiality, uh, or just asking these people to uh, go to another place for two days and then return might be sometimes enough. So the assessment of the threat and the decision on which measure should be adopted is for the court to do. The question of 100% protection doesn't exist. So leaking information could happen, although we were in close session, it shouldn't, of course, happen. Protection, you cannot guarantee 100% protection. At the end of the day, there will be a, 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 a percentage that uh, victims might or witnesses might be at a certain type of risk and that's why the whole idea is voluntarily when witnesses decide to come to the court but we try to reduce that risk to the, to the extent possible throughout, through these organs and through the assessment of the chamber by taking um, from a minimum measure up to a most drastic measure like my colleague uh, mentioned such as relocation. In relation to the email that was read by the a victim representative, one of the concerns that she raised was that uh, the witnesses were being threatened or intimidated uh, by an honorable member of parliament who is uh, within or who was escorting uh, some of the suspects. One of the conditions that uh, the judges gave was that uh, the suspects should not directly or indirectly uh, get in touch with the witnesses or intimidate them and such things. Is there then a possibility that um, on the strength of the email that was uh, read out by the victim representative, that the judges can uh, take action, probably substitute the summons to appear uh, with warrants in case of one of the suspects probably who is deemed to be, or suspects who are deemed to have been directly or indirectly got uh, in touch with the witnesses or intimidated, intimidated them through the Honorable Member of Parliament for Belgrade? Legally speaking, yes. It's, as you rightly said, it's already in the summons. There is a possibility that the chamber may revisit or replace the summons with a warrant of arrest. But the question of, in order to get or, or to delve into this drastic measure, which is the provision of liberty, the judges need to be ascertained to a certain extent that this actually happened or could really pose a risk that would justify the arrest of the person especially that the persons arrived at this institution voluntarily. And this is something that needs to be taken into account. But yes, it could happen. Referring to the same email that I wrote is contained therein, does it prejudice in any way the proceedings? And if yes, what are the actions that we're going to take? Be it either on the source date MP or the station itself? I do not think that this will, at least for the moment, prejudice the proceedings. Uh, now the confirmation of charges hearing is, uh, is closed, uh, come to an end, and now it's for the time for the judges to deliberate on the basis of what they have heard during the confirmation of charges and what has been presented by the defense and the prosecutor. Uh, if there are threats against witnesses, as we have explained, measures can be taken for protection of those people, but this will not impede the process to go on and to move forward. We cannot issue a warrant of arrest if we don't have a request by the prosecutor to do so. And for the moment, only six persons in Kenya are prosecuted. This does not mean that this is the end of the, of the matter for Kenya. There could be other cases presented by the prosecutor. 
there could be also cases presented under what we call Article 70 of the Rome Statute, which is offences against the administration of the court. When people, for example, are trying to threaten witnesses. So we could have cases like that, but they must be initiated by the prosecutor. For the moment, we have only two cases against three persons each. And that's it for the moment. Um, Jamil, I'm from NTV. Can I take back the issue of business? And say the most drastic measures you can take is relocating business. In Kenya, I, I'm not sure whether I should say or reveal information like that, whether yes or no. It might be a possibility, and I, I should not delve into the merits of that. Uh, due to protection reasons, even if I'm not going to mention names. But uh, it could have happened, it could not. I cannot give you a clear-cut answer on that. In relation to your second question as, as to the nature of the confirmation of charges hearing, um, uh, we mentioned before in, 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 in one of, uh, of these uh, press conferences organized by the court or something similar, that this process of confirmation of charges is not a trial in itself. It is just an intermediate step whereby judges try to make a kind or act as a filtering mechanism trying to see which kind of whether these cases should go to trial or not. Um, so as I said again, it's a filtering mechanism. If the cases we, the judges decided at the end that those cases do not deserve to go to trial, then it stops there. Of course, the prosecutor can always come back with new evidence and say, I would like to try once more. However, uh, if he doesn't, then this would be the end of it. If it happened that the judges decide that there are sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds to believe, which is the standard required at this stage, then the cases will be committed to trial. And then there is another uh, stage which is more substantial in the sense that you, by the end of that stage, either acquit the person or the persons or you convict that person or the or the persons. Does this answer your question? Um, I just like to seek a clarification on my last question. Um, you've spoken in general terms about what can happen to uh, witnesses in terms of relocation, as well as the measures that the court can take when information has leaked. Well, information has leaked. What in what what action is being taken now with regard to the information that already is in the public domain? regard to people who are mentioned in closed sessions and the names of witnesses which seem to be in the hands of people known to the defense. They are in this court and that's normal. Uh, in all criminal courts you have that. You have proceedings which are confidential. And of course when you have pending confidential proceedings there is nothing we can say about them. I'm sorry but that's the only answer we can give I think to them. I don't know if I got you correct. Uh, were you saying that um, persons issuing threats or inciting Kenyans risk um, facing the law, rather the, the, the prosecutor initiating different charges against them, that what we are seeing is not only about the suspects who are already in the court, but watch out. If you're out there, you're still inciting people. You could face, uh, you could be uh, prosecuted. Charges could be um, could be instituted against you, is that what you meant? You have um, two kinds of crimes for which we have jurisdiction. You have the core crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Okay. Then we have another category of crimes for which we have jurisdiction. And of course the penalty are not the same for those crimes, that's for crimes against humanity. We call that in our statute offenses against the administration of justice. And it is said, the court shall have jurisdiction over the following offenses. I'm going to cite some of them, not all of them. Cor correctly influencing a witness, obstructing or interfering with the attendance or testimony of a witness, retaliating against a witness for giving testimony or destroying, tampering with or interfering with the collection of evidence. It's an example. We have jurisdiction over the persons who do that, independently 
of whether they have also committed war crimes crimes against humanity of genocide. It's a different types of crimes that for which we have jurisdiction in order to be able to prosecute those who interfere with our investigation and proceedings. But at the same time, do you think the Office of the Prosecutor has enough on its hands right now with Ivory Coast and Libya and a whole bunch of other places that you guys are of? They are investigating to worry about some guy making a phone call to a radio station allegedly threatening a witness or a victim. Well, this is this is part of the package. It doesn't mean that you have five, six, seven situations that when the issue comes to um, uh, threatening witnesses, that the court will remain silent. If I need to continue a case with ensuring full equality to the defense, then I would need to make sure. I order for the proceedings in general, fairness for the entire proceedings, not only the defense, I would need to ensure that witnesses are protected as well. So if I determine that, uh, or the court determined, or the judges determined that there is a threat or intimidation, probably the court would need to take certain measures in order to ensure that this, the, 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 the smooth running of the proceedings. So it's, it's part of the entire framework. It has nothing to do with whether the court or the prosecutor is busy or the chamber is busy with 10 situations or 5 situations. It's already integrated in the process. Is there anything else? Many people tend to, to make conclusions from what they've had, what they've seen on TV, but uh, give us the significance of uh, probably what we don't know, information that has been given in uh, confidence or those reductive statements. What's normally the significance of that in, in determining this the outcome? The, the chamber will take into consideration uh, everything it has heard, during those days of the confirmation of charges and everything it has been presented with uh, by the defense and the prosecutor. This represents thousands and thousands of pages of documents. The judges will take into consideration all of that together in order to see if the case of the prosecutor is sufficiently strong in order to go to trial or not. Because that's the most important. Given that the procedure for this court is very different from our own court situation. And sometimes trials are, are determined by what the public think about it. Um, in our court systems, everything is in law. There's no reducting, there's no margin. And this is already percolating down to the population. How much is the court doing? I know as media houses, we have a lot to do to educate them that there's a difference. But how much is the court itself doing? Given that this thing is live on television, people are forming their minds. How much is being done to tell them that this is not it? Something else is coming and some, some information will be concealed until certain times. We are here today just to try to help the public to understand the nature of this court. And several other previous programs that we did um, ask questions for the court, and I've done it with my colleague Gilbert and, and some other colleagues, uh, to try to uh, uh, inform or share with the public uh, some information about how this institution or how the unique nature of this institution is operating. I know maybe it doesn't answer your question in terms of legal terms because it's not a legal question, but that's the way we do. We have outreach section. We have uh, all the people around us who work at the court serves this goal. It's just to try to uh, make more outreach. It's a question of outreach at the end, as I said. We hope that people in Kenya understands a little bit more after our explanation. Of course, we are ready to, to do it again, with pleasure. All right. <clears throat> Real quick on case number two. Uh, I understand that all three defense lawyers have filed an adjournment of that case that's supposed to begin on September the 21st. Do we expect a ruling sometime soon, or is this thing going on? In other, in other words, should we get on the plane and go back home now, or stay on and see what happens? We got a withdrawal from the last defense team, so the three of them had withdrew the request to postpone the confirmation of charges here. All three? Yeah. It's out. So they're showing up on the 21st? Yeah. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is regarding the second case. Uh, is uh, the accused chambers uh, going to make uh, a decision on uh, one of the lawyers who happened to have uh, 
left the prosecutor's office and joined the defense team before the hearing starts or the decision will be made after because we are remaining with a few days to the hearing. Uh, well, uh, indeed, I doubt that the appeal chamber will issue its decision before 21st de September, but uh, you may be right. So we, we may start uh, the confirmation of charges hearing without having that decision. Uh, please take into consideration that the appeals does not have per se a suspensive effect. So for the moment the decision which applies it's the decision of the pretrial chamber, which rejected the application of the prosecutor. So this is the situation as of today. And until there is a decision of suspensive effect taken by the appeals chamber, which the appeals chamber for the moment, to my knowledge, didn't take, the decision of the pretrial chamber applies. Did the lawyer, who, uh, so to speak, switch sides, did he have access to uh, um, private information of case number two. Um, why, why is it so important for the prosecutor to then get this guy kicked off the case if he didn't? I don't know really what to tell you. Uh, whether he had access or not, that's a question I cannot answer you because that's, that, that's mainly the, the details of how the pre-trial chamber arrived at its conclusion. Some, things, some information is confidential about that. Uh, why the prosecutor wants to um, um, uh, kick the guy out, that's very simple because it's a policy issue if one works with the prosecution and he leaves, probably the prosecutor would be afraid or concerned that that person might leak certain information, if at all, even if he has or he hasn't. It's a matter of principle. And that's in any event, you can ask someone from the members of the prosecutor, but I'm just telling you what I think personally, and that's in my own capacity, my answer which I'm giving you. I'm not responding on behalf of the office of the prosecutor. I'm not in a position to do that. But I'm telling you it's a matter of common sense. What is clear, however, is that that lawyer was not dealing with the Kenya case in the office of the prosecutor. That's true as well. So that has to be extremely clear. He was dealing, if my information is correct, with Sudan cases, Darfur cases. So not at all with Kenya cases. So whether the prosecutor is willing to have a policy or not is different, actually, from the law. That's true. And actually, it was rejected because the policy of the prosecutor is not really in accordance with the clear wording of the Code of Professional Conduct for Counsels. And that's why what the prosecutor was asking for was not, according to the pretrial chamber, in accordance with the law, because that lawyer was not dealing with the Kenya case in the office of the prosecutor. Still on the same question, uh, if the appeals chamber does not make a decision before the confirmation of charges hearing starts for the second appointment, and uh, the hearing goes on before the trial chamber up to the end, and then later on, maybe the appeals chamber finds that indeed this lawyer was private to him. That is maybe the worst scenario. So they say that uh, he was private to the information. Does it mean the confirmation of charges now will start afresh because of this lawyer or they'll just go on with what was given at the confirmation? Because back in Kenya, I know when uh, such a thing comes up, the trial starts afresh. Or rather, the hearing starts afresh. So that <coughs> people will go back to the hearing. There is nothing, nothing in the statute or the rules which says that we have to do again the confirmation of charges here. There is no obligation. Whether that will happen or not, it's something that actually I don't know at all. As uh, legal advisors, uh, we time and again have the accusations or allegations that this process is political, there's something fishy about this. Some people are about to be locked out of elections, next elections. Uh, my question is, is this political? Second, is there a deliberate attempt to balance things, to balance between case one and case two? And what if confirmation is here on your, your case one, on your case two, and on the other, the, other, the other case? Does it matter? Well, as you rightly started, you said, as legal advisors,
when legal advisors give advice to judges, we give legal advice. We don't give political advice. Of course, we do not work in vacuum. We are surrounded by the political reality. So this institution, I'm not going, I'm not going to try to tell you it's 100, 100% purely legal. No, we are aware of the political situation around us. But that doesn't mean that we are dominated by politics. Rather than we are bound by the parameters of law. This is our Bible. Okay? And that's what we are bound to do. So when we give our advice, we say, the law says this, and then the judges make up their minds and say, okay, we will go ahead in that direction. So at the end of the day, the determination will be mainly, mainly 99.9% .9 legal. Okay? And the 0.1%, which I'm saying, is policy consideration if there might be implications that would arise. For example, as you said in your second question, what if case one and case two? Maybe there could be some determinations in that respect about timings of issuing certain decisions at certain periods of time that ensures that there is no violence that's going to exacerbate. But this has nothing to go against the law. It's still reconciled within the law. The law is right, but for policy consideration, we might say, okay, this comes now, this is a little bit delayed for that reason. And that's what I meant by being working within the political reality. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yes, thank you. I, don't know if I, got I think you answered it, but let me just ask it anyway. Are they going to rulings for case one and two? Will those be made together? Will that be made together? In other words, with all six suspects in the courtroom? There is no decision taken in this respect for the moment. There is a legal possibility according to the regulations of the court, to do so. The judges may decide, because they have the power to do that under the regulations, to issue both decisions at the same time. That power, they have it. They can decide that. They didn't decide it that yet. There is a possibility that one side could walk away and the other side could stay. There is a possibility, according to the evidence the judges have, that part of a case is confirmed and not the other part, that one case, I would say, charges against one or two persons are confirmed and not against the six, all combinations are possible. It will depend on the evidence against each suspect. It is not per case, it is for each person. They will decide on the basis of what they have received and what they have heard against each of the six. The final result, we don't know. The decision could come out at any time while the suspects are not here in The Hague. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be present. The decision could come out and they are notified by that decision. But you do plan to tell us, right? <laughs> do not worry, you will know when the decision will, will go out. But the idea is just when the judges will take their decision, it's not necessary, there is, at least for now, there is no request from them for the suspects to be present in The Hague for this day. So they might be in Kenya or another place and the decision can be issued and then notified to them. There is no legal obligation for them to be here when the decision is rendered. Exactly. Yes, I think one of that. Will there be a notification? Will, will, will we know in advance, for instance, in two weeks' time, oh, the, the ruling is going to be given on a certain date, or we just read on the website the way we sometimes get oh. caught? Oh. Well, uh, unless the judges uh, uh, decide before and indicate uh, uh, or issue an order saying we will issue the decision on this date, unless that happens, the general thing that we do is when the decision is uh, issued, there is a press release that is sent to all of you and you will be immediately uh, uh, informed about the decision when it will be issued. As I said, unless the judges decide in advance to indicate at which date they will issue their decision. What you all just said doesn't make much sense because what if they, issue, what if they confirm these cases, these charges, and these guys pull an Omar al-Bashir? Who's to stop them from not wanting to come, even if you issue arrest warrants? They could go to some island and just stay there. I mean, does that make any sense? As you know, we don't have an army. <laughs> we don't have a police. 
And personally speaking, uh, we don't have jurisdiction to go to islands and to arrest people. Uh, we will, if the judges think that this is necessary at one point, they may issue warrants of arrest, and then we ask the cooperation of states in order to arrest those persons. That's what has been decided by states in 1998 in Rome, and we are bound by the Rome Statute. That's what we have to apply. If states want to arrest those persons, if warrants of arrest are issued, but then we, we will receive those people and we will go on with our proceedings. If they are not arrested, there is something which we cannot do in the Rome Statute, it's a trial in abstention. This is the reality. As my colleague said, this was decided by states in 1998 in Rome, and that's what they wanted. The court doesn't have any police force. We cannot do much. All what we can do, okay, here is a decision, here is the one of the arrest. A one of the arrest sometimes could be under sea, it could be whatever. But the fact of execution of that one, that depends on the will and the political will of the states. So if they don't want, they don't want. We cannot go with guns ourselves and arrest the people. Up to now, there is no warrant of arrest. Uh, the confirmation of charges has just been closed. There will be a decision on that if the charges are confirmed. And if uh, the person doesn't want to show up, then they might be a warrant of arrest. There's a lot of if, if, if. What is certain up to now is that these suspects has been cooperating with the court, has uh, voluntarily appeared before uh, the court, and has have been here for the confirmation of charges. That's what is certain up to now. So let's not just put a lot of if what will happen uh, uh, in three or four cumulated uh, ifs, if I can say. It's always good to look ahead, by the way. Yeah. On this decision, are we still on the timeline of 60 days or the well, my colleague answered this question at the very beginning. We have 60 days that will start from 24 of October. Yep. So far, that's the time. It will start running from then, unless decided otherwise by the judges. And as my colleague explained, it could be legally possible to vary this regulation by another regulation if good cause is shown, if there is a reason, compelling reason to do that. But so far, 60 days from 24 of October. So that's the day. 60 days from 24 October. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what I said. From 24 October. That's Christmas Eve. That's it. <laughs> that's, it. that's right. The term of the current prosecutor ends, I believe, in July next year. Um, and we've seen the, the, the confirmation hearings go on with, with regard to the, the prosecution, really without him. But could a change in the person holding the office of the prosecutor change, for instance, the, the strategy, the legal strategy, the pace and the, the cadence of how they approach uh, that case. And what sort of safeguards do you have in case now that, that, that sort of happens with the personality change? When the prosecutor decides to start a case, uh, that case is not really in his hands anymore. That's the process of the ICC. It is first in the hands of the pretrial chamber, and if charges are confirmed, then the case is in the hands of the trial chamber. Uh, indeed, after the confirmation of charges, he cannot even withdraw charges without the agreement of the trial chamber. So it's not really in his hands. The fact that it's going to change in, Ju in June, not in July, in June, in fact, June 2012, in my point of view, uh, could not change too much. Of course, there can be a change in the presentation of evidence by the OTP, things like that. But the case, if it is sent to trial, will go on. That's for him, it's over. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, and thank you, Gilbert and Mohamed, for this very clear answers. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you.